Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm not sure we are very interested in, in the translational part. So we are very interested. Uh, I think we, we love uh, bacteria. Uh, we are very interested in trying to understand how, how bacteria evolve and adapt to, to different hosts, including humans, to, to produce disease. And in the lab, in the, in, the, in the past years, we have been working with the role that phages, that are viruses that infect bacteria and uh, pathogenicity islands have uh, in these processes. Our model is a staff outreach that, as, as you probably know, it's, it's a quite important uh, human and animal pathogen. It's a gram-positive uh, toxin. And, and in humans, uh, and also in many different animals, it, it produces, uh, many people can be uh, can carry this, this, this bacterium with no effect. So it's, up to 30, 40 percent of the of the people, for example, can be nasal carriers with, with no effect. But uh, it's a quite important opportunistic pathogen, and, and, and it can produce so many different uh, and important um, diseases. And we started. I'm I'm, I'm vet by training. So uh, and we started trying to understand. So staff audience it assumed that it's a human pathogen originally. So when I was in the vet school, we thought that it was some kind of zoonotic pathogen that can jump from humans to animals and vice versa. And, and that's not completely true. So what we know now is that the staph virus is a, is a human pathogen originally, and from humans uh, jump to different animals. And once in the new host, when, when, when the jump has happened, staff adapt pretty well to this host, but not to others. So that means that human strange effect in a, is, uh, uh, Staph are used to infect in human, in fact, very well the human, but not, for example, the rabbit or not the sheep. And sheep is strange, in fact, very well the sheep, but not any other animals. And we, we wanted to know how that happened, so how the jump happened. And for example, we showed that from human to rabbit, just one single nucleotide mutation in the cool genome was sufficient for, for the jump. But for many of the jumps, uh, we, we realized the, 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 mobile, the mobile genetic elements uh, play an important role in this uh, host adaptation process. And by definition, so we, we, we are even challenging this kind of concept of mobility, but we assume that mobile genetic elements are you know, include transport, transposon plasmids, ICs, so elements that can move from one bacterium to another. Many times in semi species, but some of these elements can even go to completely different species. And among these mobile genetic elements, we were very, very interested on phages that are viruses that infect bacteria and uh, another uh, family that are the, the pathogenicity element. And you can have here the, the definition for a pathogenicity element. The pathogenicity element was discovered when people start sequencing strains. They realize that sometimes some, some strains have a specific region in the bacterial chromosome. Sometimes it's pretty small, like 10 kilobases. Sometimes it's pretty big, like 200 kilobases. And this, this region usually encodes uh, virulence factors. Some strains might have this region. Some strains don't have this region. So it's, it's depending on the strain, you can have different repertoire of pathogens say islands. For specific islands, they always integrate in a specific part of the bacterial chromosome. And it's assumed that they are mobile because many times we can find genes related to, to mobility, but it's not very clear. In the Staphylococcus aureus, we have a very nice, uh, very interesting uh, family of pathogenicity islands that we call SAPIs. They are pretty small, so it's like no more than 15 kilobases in size. But you can see here, can you see my, my uh, the pointer? So usually this, these elements have in pink, in this case is uh, an island called SAPIBOB1, three toxin genes. And they are very important in terms of the violence because that toxin, for example, the TST is the, the gene that encodes for the toxic shock syndrome, uh, the toxin for the toxic shock syndrome. So every time a staff produces a toxic shock syndrome is because the strain has one of these sapis. So they usually encode pretty important virulence, uh, uh, usually toxin genes. And they are pretty frequent. So you can see here, so this is the kind of variety of, of, of virulence factors that they can encode these apis, they can encode toxins, some of them, not, not very frequently, but some of them encode antibiotic resistant genes. Many of them encode genes related to uh, host adaptation. So it's like the sapis that you find in human strains are different 
that the SAPIs you find in rabbit, in, in, in sheep, for example, because they usually have genes related to the host. And some of them also have a role in biofilm formation. And it's important to know that almost half of the clinical isolates have SAPIs. And in staph audios, all these strains have at least one phage, one prophage. When the phage is integrated in the, in the chromosome, we call prophages. So in a staph, it's likely that one strain has three, four prophages. All the strains, almost all of them have at least one. And 50% of the strain, between 40, 50% of the strains will have a staph. So these two elements, these two mobile, are really frequent in the, in the staff and uh, the clinical isolates. And you can see example of many of these SAPIs in many of these different strains. The genetic structure is pretty well conserved, the same color, same function for the gene. And you always see in the, in the end, in pink, different virulence factors. Usually the virulence factors are at the end of the SAPIs or at the beginning. You can see that all these SAPIs always have one, two, three, four different virulence uh, factors. Even they are pretty small, the, the, the arsenal is pretty good. And we are very interested because they are mobile and we have been working a lot with the mobility. So they can move from one extreme to another very easily, okay? And that's because they have a very lovely life cycle. So when we have an strain that has a prophate and has a, one of the sapis, we can activate the prophate. And for example, if we treat with antibiotics, that, that activates what it's called the cell response in, in the bacterium, which activates that red key. And the prophages are in the chromosome because they have a repressor. In presence of this red key, active form of red key, the repressor is degraded. So the prophage, it induces, will go out from the chromosome, will start replicating, and the cells will lapse. But for many years, we know that as soon as the phage is being induced, because this antibiotic treatment, the SAPI sends that. And also they can be induced and excised from the chromosome and start replicating. So this is the, 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 the nice example we see. Okay, this is, is a strain that has a prophate and has a SAPI. And as soon as we put antibiotic, you can see that the SAPI DNA start replicating. This is 50, 60, 90, 100 minutes. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies of the SAPI DNA because the antibiotic and the presence of the fate. If we remove the fate, nothing happened. So for SAPIs to be active, they require, they, they require a, a helper fate. And the reason for that is that they have evolved a lovely system that once they are induced, they hijack everything from the fate. So this is the classical fate particle. You can see the big size for the, for the capsid because the phages usually are 45 kilobases in size, but the sap is that are smaller 15, they can have the ability to hijack everything from the phage to produce the sapi particles. So somehow the sapis are like the phage of a phage. It's the parasite of the parasite. And as soon as the cell slice, you have these kind of phage particles and also sapi particles, so we can move the SAPI particle. This is a classical uh, experiment with you or transduction of the mobility. When you have just a phage, the number of phage particles we have is very high. But when we, we have an, an island, because the island uses the phage, you can see that the phage, the title is being reduced. But the important thing here is that we have manipulated these islands to put a marker, an antibiotic marker, to quantify the mobility. And we can get more than 100 million particles of SAPI per mil of culture. So these elements move in a highly, highly, very high frequency, never seen for any, any other mobile genetic element. So that means that the strains in a staff audience can change these elements very easily. And this, you need to remember, it's promoted by things like the antibiotic treatment. So when we treat patients that have phages and have sapis, we are promoting this variability. We are promoting this transfer. And it's also important because uh, sometimes people want to use phages to treat uh, uh, infection. These islands, because they are phage parasites, you can see that they block phage infection. So some of the phage strategies need to remember that cells have 
anti-phage system, but also have parasites that because you use the phage, they will block the phage. So the phage will not be functional in terms of killing the cells. And that's because there are so many me mechanisms. We are not going there, but you have the reference in, in case you want to read more that these sapis have to hijack everything from the phage. And so, so this is kind of the, 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 the cycle we have now after many years of working. So you can have a string with a sapi, we say this is 50% of the cases, or it can be infected by a phage, or you have the string with the sapi and the phage, and the phage can be induced by the antibiotic. As soon as that happens, the phage will start replicating. The sapis will, will sense that, will excise from the chromosome as well, will replicate as well, and at some point will hijack everything from the phage to produce these sappy particles and some phage particles. The phages will lyse the cell and then the sappy particles will go to a new recipient cell and will inject the DNA. And that mobility, as I said, is really, really high. The process is even nicer because we published last year that we can have in a strange two sappies and some sappies are induced not by the phage, by, by the other sappy. So it was like three lines of parasitism, one phage inducing one sapi and the sapi inducing the other sapi. And again, moving in a very high frequency. So we need to remember that that mobility always involves important virulence uh, factors that we can promote with the antibiotic treatment. Sapis are not just present in, in the staff and we know that they are also present in other gram-positive bacteria, like Enterococcus, Lactococcus, Streptococcus, are plenty of these elements and we call now the family PIKIS for phage inducible chromosomal islands. And we also know that they are also gram, so, sorry, gram-positive bacteria, and we also know that they are also present in gram-negative bacteria. So we have discovered a family of this kind of phage satellites that use the phages for mobility, and they are pretty, pretty important in bacteria. Uh, uh, moving genes important in bacterial pathogenesis. And last, and this is again in, in a gram negative bacteria, you can see the phage particle is bigger and the peaky particle is smaller. So they work exactly like that we discovered for the for the sapis. And to, to, to finish in this, this, this talk, and we will not provide too, too much detail, we also know because phages can package DNA in a process that it's called transduction. And we know that sapis can also package DNA like in a similar thing of transduction. So last year we published that we know that the plasmids have an, an important role in this kind of uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, distribution. And it was known for many, many years that plasmids can have really big when they are conjugative, so they can move by conjugation, they don't require anything else. But we have a lot of plasmids that they call non-transmissible or, or the plasmids that can be uh, mobilized that they have a lot of antibiotic resistant genes, but people didn't know how they can be mobilized. And surprisingly, the sizes for these plasmids were around the size of the phage genome, and the, plas the size for these plasmids were very small, the size of the PIKIS and SAPIS genome. And we saw that SAPIS and phages not just have a role for the genes that they encode, but also had a huge role because phages are able to mobilize all these plasmids, any plasmid that have a size lower than the, uh, the size of the phage. And we also know that the peak is could mobilize all these small plasmids with size, uh, it's again, lower than the peak. So phages and sapis also can have an impact, not by the mobility, by the genes they input, but also playing a role mobilizing uh, plasmids, which are you know, very important in terms of encoding anti uh, antibiotic resistant genes. And so, yeah, that was the idea. So phages can transduce all these plasmids and sapis or pickies can transduce. And we show that they have a huge impact on moving plasmids encoding antibiotic resistant genes. Not just between staff, okay? But also we make experiments showing that we can move plasmids using sapis or pickies from staph aureus to different other staphylococcus and even to listeria monocytogenes. You can see here, you have transfer for some of the plasmids from staph aureus to different coagulase negative or even to completely different species just by the, by the transduction mediated by phages and sapis. And so that's the, the summary for the plasmid sites. 
just finishing the, the talk, thanking the people that it's, it's working in the lab here in the, in, at Imperial College in the Flowers Building and for the different agencies that pay or, or research. Thank you very much for your attention and ready for questions later. Thank you.